Okay, welcome everyone. Um, we're still accept expecting a few more people to log on, um, but we do have a lot of material to cover. So we're going to get started. So I'd like to introduce Lisa Porras from the city of San Carlos. Thank you, Joan. And good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome you to the uh, San Carlos 2040 workshop tonight. Um, again, my name is Lisa Porras and I'm the planning manager for the city of San Carlos. And I would like to welcome our new mayor uh, to this event. And Ms. Uh, mayor, she would like to say a few words before we get started. So I'll go ahead and turn the microphone over to you, Mayor Lohan. Great, thank you so much, Lisa. It's lovely to be here this evening. Um, and welcome everybody to the second workshop of the San Carlos 2040 General Plan update. Um, first off, it's an honor and privilege to serve you in this capacity this year. And, um, you know, upon reflection, it occurs to me that housing is important to everyone. So I'm really excited that we're going to have tonight's workshop, which will focus on our housing uh, element as we are required in San Carlos to plan for an estimated 2,700 new housing units for the period between 2023 and 2031. Where this housing will go is up to us to decide. This is our opportunity to come together as a community and work collaboratively to develop ideas and solutions to meet our housing needs and ensure that housing is available and inclusive to people at all income ranges. I'm sure that this will be a robust conversation and I wanna thank you in advance for your efforts and I hope you will continue to stay connected to this topic and participate throughout the life of the project. And now I'll hand it back over to you, Lisa. Lisa, you're on mute. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Joan. So to get us started, I would like to share tonight's agenda with everyone so we can sort of see what's on the table before us and where we're headed at, headed for this evening. And so before we dig into the conversation, we wanna have a brief recap of the housing element. The San Carlos 2040 uh, project is actually an update to the city's general plan. And the components of the general plan that we are gonna be focusing on are housing and safety. But tonight's meeting is gonna focus on the housing element. So we want to provide just a quick recap to make sure everyone's on the same page. There may, some, may be some new folks attending this evening. So we want to get everyone on the same footing. And then we're going to dive into the conversation. The main focus of tonight's meeting is going to be housing density, um, what factors we should consider uh, to guide the, uh, the siting of new housing units. So we're going to take a look at some examples of density, what it can look like, take a look at some numbers and massing and share that all with you and get your impressions. And then we're gonna kind of dive into some factors, priorities and criteria um, that we can think about, what we should be considering as we think about where new housing could be located. And then we're gonna focus on some maps, some areas around the city and what start having a conversation about where it might make sense to put some of this new housing. And then finally, uh, we wanna have general public comment. And I will share that throughout the presentation tonight, we're going to be monitoring the chat and I know Joan is going to talk about this, so I won't um, say too much other than there won't just be the one public comment at the end. The public will have many more opportunities uh, to, um, to, to, to speak up and get involved in where we can get your feedback. And so uh, just so that you all can have the opportunity to know who we are and who uh, is working for you, uh, representing San Carlos, our city staff that is focused on and associated with this project includes myself, as well as the Community and Economic Development Director, Al Save, and also Aaron Ackman, who is a consulting strategic advisor with Good City Company. And then on the mix, MIG side, MIG, uh, these folks are our consultants assisting us with this project. We have Lisa Brownfield, who is the project manager. We have Genevieve Shero, housing planner, and then Joan Chaplick, who is our lead facilitator. And if you attended our workshop on November 30th, you will be very familiar with Joan. So just a little housekeeping before we get started. It's just a quick reminder of you know, where you can go for the latest and most updated information about this project is our website. And if you found us here today, you probably have already been to our website, but just in case you haven't, 
you want to go to soundcarlos2040.org. And from there, we have recordings. Uh, we will have recordings of our meeting, including the one from November 30th. Some of you may have seen the replay of that. We also are recording tonight's meeting. This will also be on the replay at the project website. The project website is also a place where you can submit additional comments. You can sign up to receive automatic emails. And you can also take surveys. Right now we have our second survey located on the project website. And if you hadn't had a chance uh, to fill that out, we encourage you to do so. And if you have any friends, neighbors, colleagues, or business partners who you know would be really interested in this project, but maybe not have the time to sit in on yet another Zoom meeting, we have all had a lot of them, I'm sure, but maybe it would be more preferable to take the survey. So just please direct them to the survey. We wanna hear from everyone. This is an important project, so we really appreciate your time. So uh, without further ado, I think it's time for me to turn it over to Joan Chaplick with MIG, who's going to be walking us through the remainder of this presentation. Thank you. Okay, and once I get my slides going in the right order, um... So we want tonight's workshop to be participatory. We know the Zoom environment can feel a little bit disconnected. So we're gonna be asking you questions throughout. Um, we're gonna have some polling. So at various points, we'll give you some choices and ask you what your favorite is or ask you to answer some questions. Um, and we also want you to submit your questions and comments through the chat. We're gonna stop periodically and I'll read off the questions and read off the chat. Um, we'll be capturing all of this information. We have a digital whiteboard that we're using that we'll share periodically. And then at the end of the meeting, um, to make sure that people get a chance to speak, um, we'll have a public comment period. And we'll be asking each person to um, keep their comments to two minutes at that point in time. So um, just to refresh your Zoom commands here, um, the chat feature, you just type it in and it comes to all of the panelists. We can see it and I will be monitoring those. Um, and then when we get to public comment, there's the raise hand feature. Uh, we'll be able to call on you and take you off mute and you'll be able to speak with the larger group. Um, if you have any questions or problems, if you're trying to raise your hand and for some reason you're struggling with the command, just send us a message in the chat and we could also call on you similarly. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to be using the polling feature and um, we're going to start tonight's meeting with the same three questions we started our first workshop with. So we just want to get a sense of who's attending tonight and my colleague Anna uh, Padilla is going to be running some polls for us. So if you could respond to the first question, um, and tell us how long you've lived in San Carlos. So we have over 70, uh, 70 participants. Um, the panelists are not responding to questions, um, but we wanna get through these quickly and get a sense of who's participating and also how our outreach is doing in terms of who we're attracting. Um, so I think we have, um, uh, I'm gonna keep us moving quickly. So um, let's close the first poll and find out uh, and share the results. Um, so we find that we have almost 80% of the people have lived here more than 10 years, um, but we did attract some newcomers as well. That's great. So uh, let's go to our next question. Um, and so um, Anna, if we could have our next question uh, about your housing situation. So if you could let us know if you're a homeowner, if you rent your home, live with family or friends, or don't currently have a permanent home. So again, we want to get a pulse of who's participating in our workshops, okay? And we do, consistent with the last meeting, um, continue to find that homeowners are the most active participants in these processes. Okay, Anna, so I'm gonna take us to the next question. Um, and so what's your age? Um, the polling is confidential, um, but again, we're just trying to see who our outreach is reaching. Um, we do find that um, we find more long-term established residents are more active civically, um, but I think we've, we've done um, a better job reaching a younger population as well. So um, Anna, if you wanna share the results, um, you'll see that um, 
we've hit the sweet spot for public participation, but we do have we do have a few folks under 30. So um, good to see that there's a little more variety in tonight's participation. Okay, well, thanks thanks for that polling, Anna. And I'm going to take us to our next activity here. So um, now I'd like to introduce Genevieve Sherrill, who is going to give us a recap of what the housing element is all about so that we're all starting from the same page. And if you have any questions, send them through the chat and we'll answer as many as we can throughout. So Genevieve. Great. Thanks, Joan. Um, so if you were here for our meeting last November, this will look pretty familiar for you, um, but wanted to give everyone the same information. The housing element update that we're undertaking right now, this is part of the general plan, and it's one of the state required general plan elements or chapters. And it represents the city's plan of how are we going to meet the housing needs over the next eight years. The housing element's a unique chapter of the general plan because much of the housing element is actually driven by a statewide legislative intent rather than a local preference. The legislature and the state has declared that um, the, the availability of housing is of vital statewide importance and that local governments and the state have a responsibility to facilitate both the improvement and the development of new housing to address the needs for all economic segments of the community. So periodic updates are required by state law. This is also a unique feature from the, of the housing element that doesn't apply to other uh, chapters. Um, and so this is on a state legislative sc schedule. So that due date is January 31st of 2023 to update this next cycle's housing element. So this is the sixth time cities throughout the state have done these updates um, and cities throughout the region must have the, their housing element um, compliant by this date. If the housing elements adopted on time, it's valid for eight years. There's a penalty if, they're, if you don't adopt on time that it's only valid for four years and then you have to re-up again and, and um, redo the whole thing. If the housing element's not adopted on time or if HCD determines that it doesn't comply with state housing law, the city becomes open to probable litigation. Um, the housing element's the most frequently litigated component of the general plan, um, and the attorney general has begun enforcing compliance with lawsuits. In addition, the city can lose um, access to grants and funds, and there's also potential future penalties and future housing element cycles with allocation of additional housing units. So in an attempt to begin to address the ongoing housing challenge in the state, housing element law has established what's called the RENA process. This is the RHNA or Regional Housing Needs Allocation. You may have heard that word discussed before, RENA. Um, and this is actually a number of housing units that the state agency, the, How the Department of Housing and Community Development has determined is needed for the region um, for the current housing element cycle. So the RENA identified for the entire Association of Bay Area Governments, the entire nine county, 101 uh, city region is 441,176 units over the next eight years. And then that's broken down to each jurisdiction as well. So the RENA for San Carlos has been identified as an estimated 2,735 units. And you might notice that this is a different number from what we talked about last November. Last November, that estimate was 2390, I believe. Um, just this last week, these estimates have been adjusted by the Association of Bay Area Governments, um, and that, uh, that estimate is reflected now. The RENA is also broken down by income category. Um, so the intent is really to show that there's an availability for, of housing at a variety of different income levels. So this, um, this chart shows where that, uh, that breakdown occurs. And the percentage of, in, of uh, in each category hasn't changed with this last estimate update. Um, that remains the same, but really points to the fact that um, there's a high level of need for very low and low income uh, housing in the community with the cumulative sum of 27 and 16%. And it's important to know that the arena can be thought of as a construction goal, um, but it's not a construction obligation. So 
the role of the housing element is to show that the city has the land use policies and the zoning policies in place to allow a certain level of development to occur. But the city's not required to build these units. Um, rather, the city has to put in place those policies to allow these targets to be achieved in the private and the nonprofit markets. So moving forward, the housing element must be drafted to show how San Carlos will accommodate this arena of 2735. Okay, so I um, just want to, we're going to be pausing periodically to respond to any questions coming in through the chat. Um, so um, if there's any questions on just the general um, housing element, um, we have a question here. Just wanted to confirm, we have two years to facilitate the creation of 2,700 units, or we have eight years to do that? Great question. It is eight years, starting in 2023. So we start our planning process before it all starts. Um, we're currently in the previous cycle, wrapping that one up. So we have between 2023 and 2031 to accomplish our goals. Okay. And uh, Lisa Porras, I'm going to ask you for this question. Someone's asking why San, it's San Carlos Housing 2040. So how does that timeline correlate with the timeline for the housing element? Absolutely. So it is um, like Genevieve Shero was mentioning, the housing element cycle runs from 2023 to 2031. So because we're also updating um, the safety element, uh, we also wanted to take a comprehensive look at the general plan to make sure that as we're making changes to policy, some potentially policy changes to the land use element as well. The land use element um, basically sets forth um, the, the basic land uses and uh, intensity of uses throughout the city. Um, we know that we have um, a challenge in front of us to figure out where this housing is going to go. And because there may be changes um, significant enough to warrant changes to the land use element, we wanted to make sure that the general plan, um, the lifespan of the general plan had some cushion to it so that it wouldn't be just a hard stop at 2031. So we're actually um, going to be evaluating it and that growth to the year 2040 is just a nice way to round up. We know that there will be an additional housing element cycle after that, but we wanna make sure that we're not just stopping hard at 2031 since we're making other changes to the general plan. So that's why we um, reference the year 2040. Okay, thanks Lisa. Um, Genevieve, can you define a housing unit? Sure, that's a good question. Um, so a housing unit is uh, a unit, uh, so it can be an apartment, a condo, an accessory dwelling unit, anything that is a fully contained housing unit. So this doesn't include dorms or prisons or assisted living facilities where there's congregate care, but anything where there is individual units of space, be they studios, three bedrooms, whatever size they are, um, but an individual household unit. Okay, and there's not a specific square footage tied to that, is there? There is not, no. Whatever the minimum size that's allowed by the building code to, uh, to account for that, which is pretty small. It's like a few hundred square feet. Okay. Uh, let's see. Lisa Porras, um, did we meet our goals in the current general plan? Uh, well, I'll just qualify that a little bit. Um, our last housing element cycle was from the year 15, excuse me, 2015 to 2023. And the total number for that was 596. And we are just under that number. However, most of those units have been constructed in the above market or market rate category. It's still a challenge and it's uh, very difficult to achieve um, the numbers in the below market rate category. So um, I'm not sure if, if that answers the question, but in the last housing element cycle, we met the total number, but we still have some work to do in the below market rate categories. Okay. And uh, Genevieve, I have a couple of questions around the RENA numbers. So I'm going to give them all. Um, and if you could share what you know more about how these numbers are determined. So there's a question about why the number increased. Um, you mentioned since November it had increased. Um, and then also, did do the RENA numbers take into account, um, this person notes that there have been reports of people leaving the Bay Area in droves. Has that been factored in? Um, Great. I'll, I'll, I'll respond to both of those. So um, the first, the number went up 
between the 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 council of governments has a, a what's called a blueprint and between the draft and final um, the the commission adopted a number of new strategies to meet climate change goals um, and those were set by the california air resource board so those strategies um, are designed to encourage more growth near transit areas. So those cities that have um, better access to transit saw an increase in their housing numbers um, as a result of that. And um, with regard to the question about the number of people leaving the yeah, so um, the it, we've seen this in a little bit in the in the SCAG region too, where there's been um, some region wide contesting of the numbers based on um, a variety of factors. And the state has been um, pretty hesitant to approve any of those. Um, I think there's a kind of overarching uh, belief that, that the housing needs that exist, um, first of all, a lot of why the arena is so high is addressing some existing pent up need that's not being accommodated with folks doubling up and other things as well. Um, so there hasn't been a shift to um, address any recent, you know, post COVID changes to population. Um, and I think that it's, um, it's unlikely to happen given what we've kind of heard from the state. Okay, and so Genevieve, given that there's also a, a comment about is, you know, telecommuting taken into account um, because of the number of people working from home right now. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so the, these draft numbers were formulated, the methodology was formulated before I think quite so many people were working from home, um, but the, uh, the demographers and the, uh, the folks at the state and at ABAG, um, they have a lot of methodology and um, they're pretty smart folks working on, on this and using a lot of different factors to, to build these, um, these assumptions. Okay, and just to um, clarify, so a four bedroom house would equal one housing unit, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, um, and then we have a, a comment about the San Carlos jobs to housing ratio. Uh, the person suggests that it's uh, still 12 to one. Do you know th if that's the correct number? Um, I don't have the most up-to-date uh, ratio of jobs to housing. Um, as of now, um, but certainly a, a 12 to 1 ratio would suggest a need for more housing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, great. Well, we're going to move on to our next section. We still have a lot more to cover, um, but we, you know, again, I want to continue to um, have people uh, submit their comments through the chat, their questions, and um, we'll continue to move forward. So we're going to be building on the, each workshop is going to build on what we've learned from the previous ones. So we just want to check in with you quickly and share what we've heard so far. So there was a workshop held in November 30th that was referenced, and it was to get us started, introduce the process, get a sense of concerns and ideas. We talked about housing, and we also talked about the environmental safety element, and we had 65 very active participants. Um, and then concurrently around the same time frame, we did a short survey, and we wanted to um, get a sense of people's opinions about housing needs and we asked them some questions about some housing issues. So again it's 76 participants um, and it just gives the team a pulse on what um, interested people are responding to. Um, this is the digital whiteboard that serves as the record for the November 30th workshop. There is also a workshop summary. The materials are on the website, but I just want to summarize some of the key highlights as it came to housing. So um, the issues and concerns that we heard frequently um, throughout that meeting, uh, concerns about the impacts of traffic and parking, the impacts on our schools, um, considering equity concerns, um, people concerned about the capacity of our infrastructure, um, the need to balance open space and housing, um, concerns about height limitations, and also maintaining the character of our community. Um, at the same time, there were a lot of issues. Um, it was a very solution-oriented discussion with many of the participants having a lot of ideas for ways to go about responding to San Carlos's housing needs. So there were suggestions of considering 
duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, ADUs, looking to create more multifamily housing, providing transportation connections, revising parking requirements, looking at zoning revisions, um, incorporating walking and biking, looking at taller buildings. Um, and then we had the interesting suggestion of creating an advisory group of people under 40 to comment on housing. So these were just some of the ideas that came in. We talked about the safety element as well. So this is just a quick review of some of the topics that came up. The, just a reminder, the safety element focuses on environmental safety. So things like the urban wildland interface, wildfire safety, flooding, and such. So those were the topics that were quickly covered. Our first survey, I'm just going to give a quick preview. The results are on the website. Uh, of the 76 respondents, 83% lived in Carlos and they, they were primarily homeowners. Um, some key findings, uh, we asked out of nine different housing types to pick their top three. So here's how the top six scored. Um, the most, the top choice being um, apartments with uh, six units or less, townhomes, condominiums, um, apartments with, I think, seven units or more, senior housing, and single-family homes. Um, and then we tested a, a few statements. And um, again, the full results, but these were just some numbers that stood out. So when we asked about the importance of certain statements, this first statement, more than two-thirds, um, along with the other 33% who thought it was somewhat important, um, brings it up to 98%. Um, thought it was important to ensure that teachers, police, fire, and related safety workers could afford to live in San Carlos. Um, some other numbers that stood out, 55% thinking it was somewhat important to ensure that youth who grew up in San Carlos could afford to live there as adults. 50% thought it was somewhat important to ensure that people who work at downtown businesses can afford to live in San Carlos. So again, these are just some highlights from the 76 people who responded, but it does give us a sense of some of the interests and concerns and priorities. So um, with that, I just want to check in and see if there are any um, questions that came in. We do have a number of comments that have uh, come in, some um, additional questions. Um, so we'll be doing our best to answer them um, and then also follow up. Um, some of them are pretty detailed right now. So um, just want to alert you, we are tracking the questions and we'll, we'll do our best to answer them as we move through the meeting. So um, we're going to follow this now with um, sending it back to Genevieve Sherrill to talk about housing and density. Great. Thanks, Joan. Um, so what does housing density look like? So we, we know that we have these housing targets out there. Um, so we'd like to give you a little bit of a, a primer on, on what housing density can look like and, and the terminology that we use. Um, so the, uh, we talk about density in terms of DU per acre or dwelling units per acre. So it's good that we had the discussion about what a, what a unit is. Um, so this is the number, this is how housing density is explained. The number of housing units that can exist per one acre of land. So the lowest density type of housing is detached single family houses. This is usually between one and nine dwelling units per acre. Um, so then this kind of increases from there with duplexes, fourplexes, um, some courtyard buildings um, in the teens and 20s up to cottage courts. And you'll see there, there's, there's kind of an overlap um, and a pretty wide range of densities within a cottage court type, type development. Um, townhomes tend to be about 10 to 20, a little bit up in the higher 20s. Um, and then moving up into different types of apartment and condo style mid-rise developments up to 60 dwelling units to the acre or higher. So uh, there's a number of factors that can influence density. You can see there's a wide range even though in those types of, of building types. So one of the key factors is unit size. 
So um, if a, if there's a larger number of say studio uh, apartments in a building versus three bedroom apartments, you're able to get a higher density. Um, it's often also linked to parking requirements and how much parking is on site. Uh, open space on site or setbacks, as well as in a mixed use project, if there's commercial, um, that can also affect and lower the density. So there's also factors that can influence our perception of density. Uh, building forms, proportions, the finished materials, the massing, the general appearance of facades or the building faces, um, available shade and sidewalk amenities, all of these things can affect a development's character and the pedestrian or um, neighbor's experience. So such a, these details can really shape how we feel about a structure or development. And we also might be more willing to accept some density if we know that we can achieve some additional very much needed affordable housing in the community, um, accommodating some of those uh, housing options for school teachers and other local service providers to live in our community. So I wanna go through just a few examples from all around the state of what different densities look like, different building types, just to give a little bit of a flavor of um, what can happen at these various densities. So these two examples, the one on the left is from Los Angeles, the one on the right from Dublin. Both of these building types are kind of a walk up townhome style that can be achieved in the lower 20s, uh, 20 units to the acre uh, category. Looking at some of the 30 uh, dwelling units to the acre um, type developments, the, the option on the left um, from La Habra is about a three, somewhat four, three to four story development. The one on the right is a largely three uh, and four story development as well from Oakland in a mixed use um, development right across from the West Oakland BART, BART station. These examples are interesting too. So you can see getting up into the 40 units to the acre, these can also be achieved at both three and four stories. The option on the left in San Diego, um, the option on the right in Redwood City um, is able to achieve 45 units to the acre in three stories, um, largely due to the unit size and um, parking. Here's two interesting examples. These are both affordable housing projects. The one on the left is an affordable housing project um, in San Pedro, South Los Angeles area. And this project is a family housing affordable project with uh, artist studios, um, artist space on the ground floor. Um, so these family homes are able to achieve 56 units the acre in four stories, whereas the affordable project on the right from Mountain View, these are workforce studio apartments um, and fi uh, 59 units to the acre. Here's a few examples of the same um, density here. Um, the uh, options in uh, Aliso Viejo, uh, the one on the left here at 55 units to the acre. Um, the one on the right, uh, you might uh, recognize this is an approved project in the city of San Carlos uh, with four stories. So achieving the same density, but a very different look. Looking at a bit higher density, but still able to achieve these in four story developments. The one on the left is from Emeryville, the one on the right from Pasadena, very different development styles. And looking here again um, at a 78 to the dwelling unit to the acre example on the left in Fullerton, on the right in Mountain View, able to achieve 89 units to the acre in just four stories there um, due to smaller unit sizes. And then finally, uh, looking at, you know, much higher um, densities beyond what we've seen so far here in, in San Carlos. Um, but it's kind of interesting to see that in six stories, um, the density can be doubled. Here on the left is, an, is a project in Santa Ana. On the right is actually modular construction from um, the city of San Jose. So that kind of gives you a, a little bit of a background on what different types of buildings could have a density of. So now we'd like to play a fun game that we call Guess the Density. Um, we're gonna give you the option to use your polling feature and um, participate. And 
take a wild guess. We gave you a little bit of background information. We didn't want to leave you totally um, defenseless, but let's go ahead and try it out. So we'd like to show you a few here. So this example, what would you think? Um, this is, might look familiar. You might have seen this one in town before. If you had to guess, what do you think the density of this project is? Okay, well, about half of you have weighed in. So let, let's keep going. We have, we have five questions like this. So let's see, the voting is slowing down. So Anna, why don't you share the results and we'll see what people think is, okay. So the most popular answer is 41 dwelling units per acre. Um, so let's, let's show them the right answer, Genevieve. All right, this one is actually 37 units to the acre. Um, we also had about a quarter of the people thinking that it was the 51 units to the acre. So this, um, this is at the corner of San Carlos and Chestnut. Um, it does have one ground floor commercial unit um, and six condominium units above it in a four story building, able to achieve 37 units to the acre. This is a very small lot, um, which helps to increase that density. Okay, ready for our next one? I sure am. Okay, so this one we have here also might look familiar to folks around town. Okay, the voting's picking up. What do we think? 40, 52, 64, 68? Well, right now, 52 is leading. Mm. Okay. Um, how about if we wrap up the voting? Anna, if you want to share the results, what's the most popular answer? Looks like 52 units to the acre is the most popular half of folks thought that was what it was. It's actually 64. This project was able to achieve 64 units to the acre for our below market rate units of the 34 units uh, in the property um, and includes a number of, of two and three bedroom units as well. Okay, let's go on to our next one. Great, this one might look familiar to you too. Um, do you think this is 25 units per acre, 37, 46, 50? Okay, it looks like 37 is the most popular for now, but it's changing. Okay, let's, let's just get a few more responses in. Okay, Anna, let's let's close the poll and see what the most popular answer is. And we have 37 is the most popular and you are correct. 37 units to the acre for Wheeler Plaza. Um, this one has 109 condominiums in your town with um, ground floor commercial space there. Okay, and let's go on to one more. Great. So if you had to guess uh, the density of this one on a smaller project, um, 25, 37, 63, 97 units to the acre, what do you think? Okay, just a few more folks, if they could respond. Okay, Anna, let's close the polling, see what the most popular answer is. Okay, so we had the most popular answer being 25 units to the acre with, um, this is a shocker, this one is actually 97 units to the acre. Um, this project is 100% affordable, uh, 23 below market rate studio apartments and, a, and one two bedroom manager unit. Um, it is under construction uh, in your town today. So this one's a shocker. Okay, let's see what the next one is. All right, this is our final challenge. Um, can you guess the density of this proposed project? Do you think it's 12 units to the acre, 24, 35, 42? Or have we totally thrown you off by, by the last one? Okay. 
Okay, just uh, a few more folks if they could weigh in. I think we've just about everybody. So let's let's close the polling on this, see what the most popular answer is. Great, the most popular response is 24 units to the acre. And let's see if it is. No, double that almost at 42 units to the acre. This project was approved in 2018 and the building permits under review. Um, nine units um, and 15 parking spaces on Magnolia. So that's a, that's a fun challenge um, to just kind of think about how the very different um, densities can look at projects throughout the state and, and in, in San Carlos as well. Okay. So when you hear the word density, um, We've, we've talked about a few things, um, but we'd like to have a little bit of a facilitated discussion about what are the words that come to mind when you hear density? Either something that you know we brought up through this presentation or something that you were bringing in that you've thought about in the past. Um, what, are, what are other words that you think of when you hear the word density? And we'd like you to put your comments in the chat so that we can start to add some thoughts to, to this facilitate, to the, uh, whiteboard here. Okay, and I'm going to read off some of the comments. I have my two colleagues, Anna and Joey, that are um, getting the comments in, and we'll create a whiteboard with all of them. Uh, we have, to some folks, it means climate resiliency. Others, uh, the words packed and crowded come up. Um, let's see, so we're looking, we're looking for um, one or two word answers. Um, let's see, we have close proximity, um, uh, density means great walkable communities, loss, loss of outdoor space, um, density, it can mean multifamily, multiple units on one property, greedy developers, compactness, congestion, height and unfairness, um, to some, it means environment, zoning. Uh, density can mean apartments. Um, it can also mean efficiency and inclusivity. Um, open space. Um, we have thickness as a response. Um, then we have a, an equation, density equals workforce, affordable. Um, we have, uh, to some, it means TOD. And I'm assuming that that's transit-oriented development. Um, we have another uh, suggestion of crowded, necessary, urban, walkable, traffic problems. Uh, we have another traffic, too many people, efficiency, high rises, multiple units on one property blocky, crowded, transit friendly, moderate heights. Uh, we have density is rabbit warren and ugly exteriors. Um, and let's see, uh, we got that comment came from Nancy. If you wanna tell us a little bit more about rabbit warren, um, walkability, burden on infrastructure, younger population, affordability, diversity, a measure of how much in a confined area. Let's see, we have, how does one respond to the discussion options? Um, so for that question right now, we're, we're asking for some one word prompts. We have the chat, but we'll also have um, uh, the public comment later. Um, some additional thoughts on density, loss of sunlight, walk to the train, um, urban, I think we've heard that before, a more welcoming community, negative impact to quaint feel, walkable, less traffic per household, more competition for my landlord, industry city, um, density, uh, their choice is influenced by whether it's high or low or where it's located. Another person responds, uh, it means diversity, loss of neighborhood, volume, 
higher number units, consequence of growth, neighbors, let's see, um, a reference to some apartments in Redwood City, like boxes with windows cut in the side, reasonable size units, blocking people's views, dynamic neighborhood, less wasted space, more housing choices, loss of privacy. Okay, so uh, we have some excellent, excellent um, uh, comments to help us uh, explore how you feel about density. Uh, we still have more coming in. Um, let's see. Uh, density, what do families do? Uh, seems to be about studio apartments. Um, let's see, we, we have some separate comments that aren't the response to this question, but we will capture them and add them to the chat. So just want to acknowledge that everything's coming through. Um, Heidi, your comment will have. Um, we have another comment that it means the missing middle. Okay, so let's see how we're doing on our comments coming in through the chat. So any other thoughts on what density means to you? And, um, uh, and just a, a note that many comments are about high density rather than low density. And that may be what people think of, uh, an assumption that density is high. Um, we have some additional comments, noise, um, unattractive, um, that it impacts supply, demand, pricing of homes, of existing homes, that is. Okay. So we please feel free. We still have time for some more to come in. We have another comment about traffic. I think that's at least the third one I've seen come in through here. Forward looking. Okay. Uh, that's a solution to affordable housing if it's well planned. Um, and then along with a partnership on funding. Uh, to some, it means the future, resourceful, growth, that it changes character. It's a consequence of growth. It's walkable. It means overburdened infrastructure, seniors, that it's well-maintained. Okay, so um, let's, let's take a few more. Um, I think these comments are very helpful. Um, uh, needs to be closely tied with improvement to infrastructure. Um, for some, it means community. It creates community. It's an efficient use of infrastructure. Congestion. Um, NIMBYs, the home, some homeowners may fight against it. Uh, Knee-jerk demonized. Inevitable. Okay, um, uh, density sets the character. Okay, and I have a few longer comments that we'll capture. Let's see, so any other thoughts on words, what comes to mind when you think of density? Um, opportunity for local businesses, undoing racial segregation, that it's energetic, um, unfair, nobody wants tall buildings near them. Uh, walk to breakfast, um, that it's for our essential workers, uh, that it's urban. Uh, it's, let's see, we didn't choose to live in New York or San Francisco. Um, density, uh, let's see, irrelevant to the appearance of the building, that it's a neutral word. Um, efficient, that's a comment that's come up several times. Too many units, um, that it's disregard to established neighborhoods. Okay, well, let's, let's just give this another minute to um, kind of round out, see if anyone has any additional thoughts on, on density. Um, we need, need to solve the housing crisis. So any other comments? And also just a reminder, if anything comes in late um, or after I've moved on, um, that Anna or Joey will grab it and put it on the whiteboard. So there's just a few more. Mass, um, that it should be planned, not random. Fairness to next generations. 
uh, forces essential workers to live in multi-unit buildings, changed character, um, a comment that density changed the Upper Peninsula. Okay, so we're, we're getting a number of comments, um, many of them focused on some of the potential impacts, whether it be traffic or noise, um, or the impact on, on character. Um, for some, the thought of density um, automatically triggers thinking about high density and some of the negative implications. Um, and then for others, they see density as a way to meet the needs of essential workers, be more inclusive, um, respond to diversity, um, create dynamic neighborhoods. Um, so we have a, a good overview of what, what the folks in this group um, think about when they think of density. And now I'd like to um, transition back to the PowerPoint and have Genevieve continue with her comments on density. So now that we've had a sense of your thoughts, um, also just some additional things that density can mean and, and several of these have already been suggested in the comments. Yep, thanks Joan. Um, so we had a lot of good feedback from you there about a variety of different things that density can mean. And here's just a couple of things to think about too um, that can go along with density. Um, firstly is a vibrant downtown. So that walkability to shops and services um, is highly um, linked to a higher density to have a walkable, vibrant downtown. Um, go ahead to the next slide including vibrant shopping options. So some examples that previous one was from Burlingame. This we're looking at the Pearl District to have vibrant shopping. Um, businesses do look at the concentration of residences um, to locate and provide those services. But there's other options too. Um, it's important to have, go ahead to the next slide. So with, with that density also can come great amenities like town centers with active uses, community gathering spaces, um, that really are vital and active and are enjoyed um, wholly by the community. Also community facilities and activities, um, more uh, like the San Carlos Youth Center and other um, destinations programs and things to accommodate that density and provide that high quality of life that San Carlos residents um, anticipate. And also thinking about inclusive communities. So the higher density can provide an opportunity for folks to um, live and work nearby and um, really be part of that inclusive community. And on the next slide, to really start to address um, equity with housing opportunities. Um, communities can be more inclusive and respond to equity concerns, addressing the needs of those who in the past may have been denied housing opportunities. Um, and this really helps to address some inequities that can, um, you know, provide more housing opportunities, more, move more renters towards home ownership, provide opportunities for our teachers and firefighters and landscapers um, and other local workers to um, live in the community. Um, so we talked a little bit about, um, you know, a variety of different things so far, but we'd like to, we'd like to think kind of high level again um, and start to think about what are really your top priorities. If um, we, we know that we do need to accommodate this new housing in San Carlos, what are the criteria that are most important to you to guide housing policy? Um, so we have a poll um, that we're going to put forward um, that we'd like to hear from you. What are your um, criteria and priorities for new housing. Um, and Joan, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we can check three responses. Yes, three. No more three. than three. So no more than three. So we'd like you to indicate your top three um, with your top um, clicked first, I think. Um, just your top three. Um, what is most important to you? Is it most important to you if um, housing is located near public transit um, or that it's spread evenly throughout the city? Um, is it most important that it has the least possible impact on traffic or that it's walkable and bikeable to shops and services? Is it most important to you that it's located near parks and services, community services, or is the highest priority for you that it's well-designed? 
There's also uh, an option here. Uh, is it your highest priority that it provides options for different types of households um, to live in San Carlos, like seniors, young adults? Um, and we have an option for other, and we'll have a discussion about that too. So we look forward to your responses on this. Okay. Well, let's give people a, a moment or two to think about this. Um, um, you know, there's, there's a number of things to consider in terms of what people value and think would be the best criteria to help um, inform housing policy in the city about where housing is located. Um, and so um, probably uh, need a few more people to weigh in. We're pretty close to having um, full participation on the questions, but I just want to give people a moment. And also as Genevieve um, noted that following this, we'll, we'll have an opportunity to talk about criteria beyond these choices. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll get to that in a moment, uh, but we're close to having just about everyone weighing in on, um, on their three top choices here. So with that, I'm going to ask Anna to close the polling and let's see what the top choices are. Okay, so um, let's see. Um, the most popular answers, um, we have located near public transit, um, walkable and bikeable to um, sh shops and services. So they're the two top scoring within this group of respondents. Um, we also have um, close below that um, is that the housing be well designed. Um, and that also that it provides options for different household types. So making sure seniors, young adults, families, that there's there's housing for them. Okay, so good. So this is, you know, this gives us some good insight into um, the criteria and priorities that are of greatest interest to the group participating tonight. So with that, we're gonna stop sharing the results and um, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, what other factors we sh should we consider? Um, so uh, with this point, we're going to go back to the mural and I'm going to ask you to send your comments in the chat to get at some of the, um, the other criteria that you think is important. And let me, let me move my mural here so that uh, you can see um, how Joey and Anna are keeping track of what's coming in. Um, so, and again, there are a number of comments in the chat that we will be um, noting and, um, and keeping in mind as we move forward in this uh, planning process. Um, and a, a Let's see, so we've had uh, a number of things for us to consider. So uh, let's start with um, impact on existing communities. Um, another factor would be the preservation of our historical buildings and landmarks. Um, we want to consider the impacts on parks, impact on schools. Um, uh, kind of a holistic comment here that our streets, schools, parks, et cetera, can accommodate the additional residents. Um, another factor uh, suggested is construction quality and space per unit. Um, that it's um, another factor that it's inclusionary, that we have a high percentage of high quality BMR units. We wanna consider the variety of affordability um, let's see, factors, um, um, things that don't destroy the neighborhood feel of San Carlos. We want to consider the equity of impact. Um, we have another uh, comment related to capacity. So the impacts on our utilities, the sewer electrical grid to accommodate new residents. We want to consider preservation of the look of our distinctive neighborhoods. So from a design and aesthetic perspective, um, that a factor that we provide the size of housing that is needed, um, a comment that one and two bedrooms aren't large enough for families, also plan on people working from home and needing office space. So some different design suggestions. Comment about design and density fitting with the existing housing design and density. Um, 
uh, factors, it should be zero emissions. So consider impact on climate, preserve um, green space. Um, there's a, a question, what, what are the factors that are most frequently characteristic of NIMBYism? And having done a lot of community outreach, um, they vary from community to community. Um, so a lot depends on, on what, what that community looks like and, and values. Um, so just wanted to respond to that question. Um, let's see, factors considering the types and housing that will help us meet our arena numbers. Um, considering the potential for overcrowding downtown. Uh, we wanna be able to maximize natural space, have natural grass in our parks, provide access to nature. We wanna consider the impact on surrounding properties. Um, let's see, uh, impact on traffic. So even as it, though it wasn't the top priority, we know people will complain. Um, I agree with that commenter. I think that's uh, probably a valid comment. Um, let's see, another comment about the feasibility of utilities so that infrastructure capacity, um, good soundproofing, uh, factor that it's feasible that to accomplish building creation, that it considers ample off-street parking. Um, let's see, that not everyone needs to live near transit. Um, they may not work where the train goes. Uh, another factor, provide affordable housing in balance with the number of local low-income jobs. Um, another comment on capacity, ensuring our utilities and roads can handle the additional people. That we uh, make a priority for local essential workers housing um, so that they can stay long-term and they're not all pushed into studios. Um, another factor is consider the impact on egress from San Carlos. So people um, leaving through San Carlos um, that we want to accomplish infill, but not the destruction of open space. We want to consider electric, all electric fuel sources and avoid gas appliances to mitigate climate change. So some general factors that take into account climate change. Uh, consider um, prioritize smaller developments to promote diverse ownership as opposed to large real estate developers. Um, some factors to consider, modernizing San Carlos for the needs of the next generation and our climate futures. Um, and then also wanting to encourage family size units. Um, let's see, factors about mitigating large office development. Um, concerns about the potential for overcrowding downtown. Um, a suggestion that high density should be concentrated near the train and shopping. Um, it needs to respond to the continued aging population. Our 65 and up population is growing. We wanna optimize space for people, not cars. The negative app impact on established neighborhoods and current homeowners. We want factors that foster community within development, include usable common spaces indoor and out, prioritize green space and parklets. Uh, we have a comment about flow and complementary uses. Um, and Jeff, if you wanna weigh in and tell us a little bit more in a follow-up chat, we'd be happy to confirm that. Um, another factor is mixed use, uh, considering the loss of park opportunities, considering existing residents and why people moved to San Carlos. It's friendly, low density. Um, consider density allows us to place housing in a single location and preserve green space. Um, concerns about single family homeowners don't not wanting their home value to go down um, and have it be harder to sell their property. Um, and just a general question about are these goals realistic? Um, uh, more questions about just essential services being expanded. So responding to the capacity and need to accommodate more people. Uh, factors consider the percentage of square foot designated for green space. So again, more support for green space. Uh, concerns about the ability of schools to accommodate. Um, put new high density near public transit, but spread public transit out. Um, 
and it's just some comments about improving the efficiency of transit so that private vehicles aren't needed as much. Requiring green infill to balance additional um, bulk and volume. Uh, let's see, diversity and equity. And let's see, I'm just getting a request to kind of zoom and scroll down the mural. So I'll just zoom in here and uh, continue. I just want to, you know, we don't expect these all to be readable, but we want you to see that we are capturing them. Um, exits off the freeway and roads into the city can handle the volume. Uh, let's see, I just lost my place here in the comments, so just give me a second. Um, we want to preserve our creeks and appropriate setback. So this is specific to concerns about open space and trails. Um, we should require minimum density, so they're not all large luxury units, new high density, creating balanced communities, um, more comments about transit, uh, having buses throughout the city, so density can be anywhere. Um, consider uh, don't build new housing that will be at risk from wildfires or sea level. Um, use low combustible landscape to protect from fire and earthquake, um, community welcoming events to build connections, include work and live spaces. Um, there should be both rental and condos. Uh, let's see, we'll kind of move this around a little bit. Um, consider noise, optimize for usable common space instead of unnecessary setbacks, manage the construction schedule to avoid traffic detours, um, Upgrade old properties. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, consider why people leave San Carlos uh, for to go to outlying areas. Uh, some other factors to consider: protect endangered species and our unique ecosystem in the Bay Area. In incentivize homeowners to park cars in public lots. Make it easier to add an ADU. Let's see. Okay, our group is, you know, we're getting uh, just some excellent comments here. Um, preservation of heritage trees. Um, let's see. Um, the RENA numbers. There's a question about the change, and um, uh, I don't know if we have any additional information about that. Um, and the others factors don't build in the fire zone. Um, bring back SCOOT, S C O O T. Um, public facilities for residents, um, accommodate wildlife movement, build up in flood zones, um, uh, concerns about mitigation with exits from 101 already backed up. Um, let's see, shouldn't be able to label units as affordable or low income. Use large lots for high density. Consider solar access, shade impact from taller buildings, additional town resources to handle larger town events. Um, let's see, uh, a follow-up comment, yes. Um, how we expand um, services, a suggestion like Trader Joe's, um, they're already super busy and their parking lots at capacity. Uh, consider the sea level rise predictions. Um, consider that per unit cost can't be too high or diversity can't be achieved. Um, an awareness, the school district is currently losing hundreds of students each year. Preserve older apartments and turn into affordable. Um, incentivize ADUs for housing instead of Airbnb short-term rentals. New development should subsidize ADUs. Make sure waste and stormwater infrastructure can accommodate growth. We should consider whether increased housing will require additional school capacity. So again, more capacity questions. Pay for scoot rides instead of Uber and Lyft. Um, another scoot comment. <laughs> um, let's see, enforce Airbnb restrictions. So again, uh, factors about um, criteria to consider. Uh, we have uh, just a comment about changing the city motto from the city of good living to the city of congested living. Okay, um, so so we've gotten a lot of suggestions of criteria to be um, uh, considered. 
um, in this. Um, again, another comment about subsidizing ADU rents, convert unused office buildings to housing. Okay. Um, connect high density housing in the hills to downtown via area gondolas. Okay, so we're moving, we're moving into solutions here. So I just want to take us back to our original question, which had to do with um, some factors to be considered. Um, so, you know, concerns about infrastructure, um, capacity, um, our community having the infrastructure, the school capacity to um, keep that in mind when we're locating housing, um, concerns about open space, protecting open space, um, a number of ideas for how to go about, you know, making sure there's there's natural space that we prioritize local essential workers for housing, um, that we keep in mind climate change in this criteria. Um, and there were a number of specific suggestions about that. Some comments related to transportation, um, maybe by broadening it. Um, so, um, so we have a few, a number of ideas uh, that continue to come in here. Um, decision making, making sure that it's aligned, planning, community affairs, land use, that they're all aligned and working together. Um, let's see. So, um, so I think we're, we're um, kind of winding down in terms of the, uh, the different factors and criteria that should be considered as we move forward in this process. And again, um, any, go ahead. As we um, take any last comments, I can respond to that Rena question. Please. Um, the question was, can the RENA change if economic conditions change post-pandemic um, and result in a lower anticipated need? Um, I, it, it hasn't happened before, um, especially after the process of going through, after the state goes through and develops that methodology, it's actually legislated what they count in. So that would have to be a change to legislation that could result in a change to the RENA uh, because what they consider in those factors is legislated. So um, unlikely to happen. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so now I'm gonna take us back to the PowerPoint to our next, um, next topic. So Genevieve, if you could walk us through, um, as Lisa Poor said in the beginning, we're trying to get an understanding of density, your perceptions about it, criteria for siting. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about locations. Great, thanks Joan. Um, yeah, so we talked kind of hypothetically in our cri criteria and our priorities and we started to get a little bit into those locations uh, because that's, um, it does come down to um, what are your top areas for locating new housing in San Carlos? We do know that um, we have this housing crisis um, and that we need to look for places where it would fit best in, in the community. So we're gonna take a look first at the city's zoning map. So a zoning map tells you where particular uses are allowed as well as the different development standards or how high a building could be, um, how far it needs to be set back, how many parking spaces. Um, but fundamentally from the colors on the map, it's telling you what kinds of uses can go where in a city. So in San Carlos, we, we of course see um, the majority of the town in yellow, which is our residential single family neighborhoods. We do also see some orange areas in the hills. These are our multifamily um, condos, townhomes in the hills that um, have been part of the fabric of the community um, for a very long time. Um, and we also have some brown areas around downtown um, that are some of the higher density residential um, developments. And then in the hot pink and the blue downtown, um, some of, uh, sorry, the purple downtown and some of the blue areas as well, um, I guess it's not blue, that's purple. So it's like purples and pinks. Those are our mixed use areas, areas that have been designated for mixed use. They might not necessarily have that right now, but that's what's allowed um, to be developed. So these are the areas in town, the pink, the purple, um, the brown, the, the orange and the yellow. This is where housing is allowed in town. So 
we have a map here that we'd like to talk with you a little bit about. This map is showing you a few things. Um, the red parcels show existing shops and services. The green parcels show parks. We've labeled City Hall and Caltrain. And as we think about new locations for housing or ha locations for housing, where your priority locations in town are for housing, um, it's important to note that the housing element's looking at the entire city. So there, we what we've pulled out here are some of the areas that currently allow a higher density of development. Um, so that we pulled those out um, with a list of letter labels for you to consider. So we'd like to run a poll here and we will also have a conversation, um, but this is a starting point for, for the conversation. So where the city currently does allow higher density housing is in these areas that are all colored with um, different letters. So among these areas where higher density housing is already allowed, where do you see the priorities um, to, put it, to put more housing within those areas? And uh, let's see, Genevieve, are you gonna walk through them? Cause I've gotten a question about one of them, the Western PDA. Yes, I will go ahead and do that. Um, so the area A is in the downtown core. B, we know the area surrounding downtown. C is over on South Laurel. D, that Western PDA, um, that is what's within a walking distance of the Belmont Caltrain station. So that is an area that's designated by the region as accessible to transit. That's and, the, the Western PDA. And PDA, what does that stand for? Oh, thank you. Um, priority development area. Okay. Yes. Um, and so then mixed use neighborhood is, is E, that gray area. That's an area that's designated for mixed use neighborhood um, along, uh, I believe that's along Old San Carlos Avenue. Um, then we have El Camino and Real. We are, we're looking at that in kind of different segments and can, interested in, in where folks see their priorities for new housing along El Camino, um, north of Holly, the kind of central area near Cal, uh, near and uh, immediately south of Caltrain, and then the area south of Arroyo um, is designated as H. Okay, so are we ready for our polling question? I do believe we are, yes. So these letters are gonna be reflected in that polling question. So we'd like folks to weigh in on what are your top three areas for locating um, higher density housing uh, in San Carlos in these existing areas where um, housing is allowed? Okay, so we'll, get, we'll give people a, a few moments to think. There's, there's uh, quite a bit of information to process here. Um, we have a question in the comments, uh, ECR, ECR stands for El Camino Real. Okay, just a, a few more, if, uh, a few more people need to weigh in and we'll see what this group of participants um, identifies as their top three areas for locating higher density housing. And these are of the areas that are already zoned to accommodate higher density housing. There's also a, a question about Devonshire or Devonshire. Sorry if I pronounced it wrong. Um, the that is a county pocket. There you can see the the dotted the little dotted lines that shows county areas, um, and and that is included there. Okay. Well, how about if we bring the polling to a close and uh, see what emerges as the top choices? Um, so we have South Laurel. Um, at 46 percent, um, El Camino Real north of Hollywood at 46 percent, um, and then next we have um, the Western Priority Development Area. Um, so they, they're the top three in this group and um, they help give the team some guidance and direction on 
on where to start looking and seeing how we can go about um, completing the housing element. Okay, so we're going to stop sharing the results and um, we're going to go back to the mural and give you a chance to, to um, um, give some additional comments on on some of the locations, um, you know, we know we want to give you a little bit more opportunity than just the poll to comment on some of these locations or other areas that you think should be considered. Um, so um, let's see what's what's coming in through the chat. Um, and again, we're looking for your comments on some areas for locating housing. So we've, you know, again have. Um, uh, identified these as some choices. Um, we have some questions about, um, uh, is there an opportunity for industrial conversion? Um, let's see. Um, and maybe someone from the city has, a, there's a comment here about uh, Melendi isn't high density. Um, so if, if someone could on the team could speak to that. Sure, Joan, this is Lisa Porras. I'll just jump in here regarding the Melendi question. Yes, there is a pocket of multifamily housing um, that you'll see off of Melendi. And of course, there's a couple areas off of Crestview as well. And if you recall the zoning map, when we pointed out those sort of darker orange or orangish colors on the map, those are the pockets of multifamily that um, are found kind of within that larger geography that's made up of mostly single family homes. So we do have some pockets of higher density housing in those areas. And I think there was also a question on like, why would we focus on the triangle portion of, 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 of housing around the downtown? And really that goes back to the question, if we start looking at the existing regulations um, that uh, existing zoning designations that already allow housing, then is there any desire or, or interest in perhaps increasing the height or the density in those certain locations around the city. So we didn't really want to throw out any areas that already that already allow residential. We just want to take another look at them and see if there's something, um, some areas that may, you know, be desirable for some changes. And I often like to think of it as kind of where do we want to turn up the dial? And is there any appetite for turning up the dial in areas that already allow residential? So that's why we included those particular areas. Okay, Joan, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Okay, and Lisa, consistent with the comment you just made, there's a question, does this mean we can't prioritize changing single family zoning to allow for multifamily, whether it be duplexes or triplexes? And um, so if you could speak to how the process will, will look at that. Sure. So we focused on areas that um, typically are going to get us a little bit more bang for a buck, so to speak. And those are typically the, the uh, mixed use and multifamily zoning designations, right, that we posted um, on the map. Um, and, you know, we're taking comments. And if there is, you know, appetite for looking at the single family neighborhood, you know, generally, um, I will have to say, um, in the planning profession, we don't really take, um, it's not very popular for us to come in and say we're changing single family zoning. Um, as some of you may know, there have been um, some new laws that were recently passed to make it easier to put an accessory dwelling unit or a granny fat flat on um, in, within uh, single family zoning areas. So that's something that the city allows. So this, this is great because certainly ADUs, we like to call them ADUs, accessory dwelling units, um, are one solution to, to this housing challenge that we have in front of us. So happy to receive the comments on, on other ideas. I mean, that's what this, this, this workshop is for and that's what we're doing right now. So perfect question, perfect timing. Okay. Thank you. So um, these are just some of the suggested locations. So we have uh, someone asking, is there space near 280? Can we look east of Highway 101? Um, perhaps along El Camino on the east side? Um, locations within a half mile of a train station? Um, lar consider large lots in the hills and run shuttles or buses. Um, is there, are there areas around the airport? Um, why not more opportunity on the east side? Um, another location, consider along Alameda. 
Uh, look at Industrial Boulevard and rezone for housing. Prioritize El Camino for redevelopment. Look at Crestview near potential 280 on-ramp site. Expand downtown along South Laurel, and that would have that would accommodate housing above retail. Um, let's see. What about the space off of Alameda above Britain Acres? Um, I don't personally want it to be developed, but I thought a building was scheduled there. Um, a suggestion to allow duplexes throughout, uh, just keep the overall setback height and square footage requirements. Um, let's see, some additional areas to consider. Uh, re look at our land, R1, and rezone it to allow for fourplexes. Um, and again, more comments on why are we not considering the single family neighborhoods for four for duplex and fourplex units. And so just an, a comment on that too. Um, so we are allowed, uh, every single family lot is allowed to have uh, an ADU. Um, so that does increase some of the density there and a junior ADU technically, which is a, uh, a unit that's attached to the house. So there is the potential of up to three units um, to the acre. I do see a few um, comments in the chat about four, um, sorry, not units to the acre, units per lot. I do see a few about fourplexes, um, which is not currently allowed. Just a clarification. Okay. Okay, good. Thanks, Genevieve. Uh, we have a suggestion of looking at the airport, um, having more housing and development throughout San Carlos, um, uh, more locate near east of, um, east of Caltrain's where there's with the new industrial office space going in there to put some high density in there. Um, east side sites, so look at those with surface parking or underperforming commercial. Uh, let's see, we have a comment about there's um, the 808 Alameda proposed development. Um, so we're looking for um, locations where housing could go. Um, so when our, our commenter has crazy idea, can you convert any streets to land for housing pavements? You know, so pavements to housing, looking at converting light industrial properties east of El Camino Real, convert from light industrial to light industrial residential. Um, what about the PG&E area? Does that need to be remain? Does that need to remain? Um, and then there's areas by PAMF, Taylor Way and Industrial, Delta Star, could they be considered for high rises? Add density near MF along San Carlos. Uh, let's see. So I'm looking for locations, uh, prioritized development of El Camino. Um, let's see. And just some comments about protecting single family home neighborhoods. Uh, put high density housing near El Camino for accessibility. Um, more comments about uh, duplexes and triplexes going throughout the city. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, uh, if it's possible, move the light industrial space to east of 101 and it create an opportunity to create a well-planned neighborhood between Industrial Ave and Old County Road, uh, mixed use, live work, nightlife, etc. Um, let's see, rezone Holly Street between Old County and Industrial for high density multi-housing. It solves traffic with the SFR there. Another comment about Old County Road, Industrial Britain are corridors that enable large complexes. Uh, east side for work, live developments. Um, let's see. So some ideas about just there's large lots in the hills, maybe if you ran buses or aerial transport. Um, a comment about um, instead of building mega mansions, in, uh, building mega mansions rather than multifamily residences is counterproductive. Think about changing zoning laws. Um, let's see, some comments of comment about protecting our historic buildings. Again, more, more comments about the possibility to incorporate duplexes and quads and noting that they work well in communities like Palo Alto and Redwood City, 
looking at rezoning. Um, let's see, look at mixed use in industrial areas, light industrial on the bottom, residential on the top. Uh, consider splitting large lots. We have a suggestion of the old Black Mountain property. Uh, let's see, along Industrial Road. Rezoning east of the freeway for multi-unit, probably rental because of the airport noise. Okay, um, just some comments and questions about the airport. Uh, replacing unused warehouses east of Industrial. Uh, what about the Delta Star property? Uh, Holly and Industrial. And uh, Genevieve, there's a question about ADUs. Um, would, would do they contribute to meeting the RENA requirement? Is that correct? They do. Um, there also is another point from another panelist that, or from another um, contributor noting that there is a, a size limitation on the ADUs that doesn't exist if it's a duplex or a, or a quad. Um, and that's true. So the, the, the ADUs that are currently um, being constructed do count towards your current um, targets. And moving forward, we will in the housing element project based on um, previous accomplishments um, and assumptions about affordability to be able to count uh, all of the upcoming ADUs towards the RENA targets. Okay, and just a reminder, uh, those of you who are, are have a comment that isn't a location, we are capturing those comments. They'll, they'll be on the mural. Um, I understand there are a number of people concerned about protecting single family zoning, um, concerns about heights, desire to protect historic buildings. So we are receiving all of those comments. Um, another location suggested is the Crestview open space area. Um, move the cement plant on Branston, east of 101. Um, a comment about PG&E, are they selling their yard on industrial? Let's see, uh, put it on the east side, walkable to the train near Jobs. Add housing atop Walgreens, Raider Joe's, Trader Joe's, CVS's. Um, let's see, put the high rises downtown, closer to 101. Industrial Road is another location to allow for higher density. Um, look at the major transit corridors. So this would be along San Carlos, El Camino Real to Alameda. And uh, just a Genevieve, a, a question. So the housing units, they don't have to be all ownership units. They can be rentals. Is that, that fits Absolutely. into the arena numbers? Absolutely. Um, it is assumed that Rentals, ownership units, any any kind of units that, that is available, new construction, um, that's what counts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and again, um, let's see, we still have a number of concerns coming through, um, definitely about protecting open space, um, concerns about neighborhood character, more location comments. Um, South El Camino on the east side, um, the small business park, across from Novartis could be increased in height and residential added on top. Um, so the question, how do I get my response onto the whiteboard? You submit it through the chat and the colleagues behind the scene are doing the addition. So I'm, I'm not um, keeping up with moving the whiteboard around um, since uh, we're getting quite a number of comments. So I'll, I'll move it over so you can see a little bit more about what's going on. So feel free to add your comment in through the chat. Uh, let's see. Um, a suggestion of looking at the self-storage spaces. How many are being used? And if not very much, consider converting to residential. Okay. So um, just a lot of good comments coming in through there. Um, and just remember, everything that comes in through the chat gets downloaded. So we have your exact wording and suggestion. We also have it on the mural. So um, you can at least see some of the flavor of the comments. Um, and we're capturing them um, exactly as they come through. Um, so let's see, what other location comments do we have here? Um, just a question about land available for redevelopment, where that might be located. 
Um, some that uh, suggestions to be achieved with zoning changes, San Carlos Ave has suggested. Um, looking at the existing large park parking lots throughout the city, especially in commercial areas. Another comment um, about the airport. Um, let's see. Okay, and then just um, um, just a number of, of comments and questions that are overall very helpful to the process. Um, but I think from this activity, um, you've helped us identify some potential locations to take a closer look at. We have the initial polling responses. Again, that is not a binding vote by any means, but it does inform where the planning team starts looking and and basically starts doing the doing the math. So um, these are um, this is how some of this feedback will be used. So I think with this, we're going to bring close the mural um, activity to a close. And again, you can continue to submit your your comments through the chat. Um, but now we are we're going to um, transition to just a quick review by the MIG project manager of the project timeline. So uh, Lisa Brownfield. Hi everyone. Um, just so uh, you kind of have an idea of uh, where this project is heading in the next couple of months. Um, we are currently in the winter spring complex uh, uh, piece of it where we are looking at uh, talking about um, housing siting criteria which you've all participated in. We're going to be also looking at potential land use changes. Ultimately, that's going to re resolve into draft elements and housing elements and perhaps zoning amendments as necessary. Um, and then it will all ultimately be sent to the state for its review and environmental analysis will be run in the fall of 2021, winter of 2022. This is anticipated with um, uh, adoption at the Planning Commission and the City Council um, being in time uh, for um, the adoption in October, uh, ex excuse me, in the in spring, ex spring and summer. Um, but what's more important about through all of this process is the fact that we have public input um, occurring throughout um, all of these stages. And um, we look forward to additional workshops, summaries, and um, other public events where you'll be asked to participate. So um, if you could go online and take the survey at this point, that would also be really helpful. Um, encourage your friends and family and coworkers to participate in the survey as well. That'd be great. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Lisa. Um, so I have a question about the Zoom. Um, so um, it's Zoom. So the team is in multiple locations. The um, San Carlos staff are in San Carlos running it from their, um, their machines there. And then MIG is hosting it. And we are at uh, different locations in our home and business offices. So um, technology has brought all of us together tonight. Um, so I, I hope that gives you a, a little understanding of how the Zoom is working. Um, so we're going to move now and use our remaining time for public comment. Um, we know that many of you probably want a chance to just use your own words. We really appreciate how participatory people were using the chat and the polling. And um, so um, you, you use the raise hand feature. We'll call on you in order. And I'm going to switch screens here. And Anna's going to take over. And she's going to pull up a screen that has a clock on it. So once we get going with the um, with the folks that we're calling on, um, and here's the order I have. Um, they come to me um, as the hands go up. So while Anna gets this set up, and I'm going to find my participant list. Things just changed around a little bit here. Just uh, give us a moment. There we are. Okay, so in my participant list, here's, here's the first three in the queue. You're going to have two minutes. Um, I have Nancy Oliver. She's followed by Debbie B. And then David Crabb. Um, Anna's going to take you off mute when it's your turn to speak. And uh, we'll ask you to um, stay within the two minute time frame. So um, Nancy, if you're ready. 
Okay, and uh, let's see, Nancy, you're, you, it indicates you're still on mute. Okay, oh, please, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, so um, I'm Nancy Oliver, and I'm with the San Carlos Heritage Association. So a lot of my comments revolved around preservation, as you could see. And I really do want whoever's uh, compiling all this to pay attention to that. We do have an historic element to the general plan, I believe. And there is a huge survey that we did, I worked on, to identify some of the historic buildings that are in San Carlos. And that only was limited to 50, but there's a whole other list that could be done now if we did a new um, survey. But I, I'm worried that we're gonna start plowing things under without due consideration for why they are important to our town and nobody else's. And I want those things to be kept really into consideration at all times. So that's my big comment. And I did have some comments about the creeks because they tend to get buried too in what's going on. And I, I think there's supposed to be a setback of, well, I don't know, 20 feet or 25 feet for the creeks. And they could be kind of redesigned into some open space things for people to go out and walk the trails on some of these beautiful creeks that we have. So those are two of the things that I thought of. Um, I've seen Redwood City and the density that they've put in the downtown and there are only two of the buildings that they built down there that I think are worthy of being, quote, a downtown building. They're beautiful. The rest of them are the ones to me that look like a box with the holes cut in the side. So I think design is really important for San Carlos. So those are the, some of the things that I thought of. Thanks. Okay, thank you for your comment, Nancy. Um, so next we have Debbie B. She'll be followed by David Crabb. Thank you very much. And I would just like to ask that uh, consideration be given to the bonus density developers. That allows them to circumvent city council review. And one example is 808 uh, Alameda. If they meet the zoning, it only goes to the planning department, not city council. And at the meeting last night, when we were talking about it, a lot of people had concerns about the density. It's 87 units. They look like uh, shipping containers stacked on top of each other. And they have huge decks on the entire top that would be an incredible noise pollutant. But even though we expressed our concerns to the developer we're basically told, well, if it's zoned to accommodate that, there's nothing that really can be done by the city. So my request is to planning, please let us have a voice at the city council level because so many people in the community do not know about these huge developments going in, especially up on Alameda. There's gonna be two of them, almost 200 units close together right on Alameda and people should be notified all over San Carlos, not those just within 300 feet. So even though development is ported, please don't let the developers circumvent the environmental impact, traffic impact and noise impact by not making well known to the community what's happening. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you for your comment. Um, next, we have David Crabb, and he will be followed by Karen Tusman. Yes, good evening. Um, yeah, I wanted to make a couple of comments. One is I would like the city to consider on their general plan and in our zoning to eliminate the idea of density limits. Uh, we saw from the illustrations that the, uh, were given tonight that density has very little to do with what the building looks like or how nice a neighbor it might be to our, an area. And also it relates a lot to the number of units in a building. And it's really kind of a constraint on, on developers sometimes. And so I would eliminate density as a criteria, but then use form-based form -based codes, which is uh, define what a building might look like instead so that you could have a maybe a high density building but with the form based codes the setbacks and the heights and so on to be determined by the city so that would be one recommendation uh that i have uh, uh the other one is that 
when we're looking at the arena numbers and look, trying to figure out the uh, sites for them and whatever is somehow we have to figure out how we can make it so that the developers can meet those low income, very low and low income uh, levels. And it's very difficult for them to do. Uh, and uh, what we have now is 15% below market rate. And most of that doesn't run right to the low and very low. And as we have from our experience, we are very terrible at meeting that level. And so I really, we need more emphasis on the lower and low, very low and low income housing, because a lot of the people that work in San Carlos are low income people, because uh, they're working in the retail areas and uh, a lot of lands, people do landscaping, you know, people maybe work for city hall and so on. Uh, they can't afford housing in San Mateo. Thank you. Okay, thanks for your comment. Our next speaker is Karen Tusman and she will be followed by Kay Goforth. Hello, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak and thank you for this really well-run meeting. Um, my name is Karen Tusman. I am a renter living in a wonderful fourplex near downtown. Um, and a couple comments. One is, you know, a lot of people I think have the knee-jerk reaction that we uh, need to preserve single family zoning. But, um, you know, I grew up in a single family home. I, I think that would have been my knee-jerk reaction a couple years ago too. But I've since learned that single family zoning was really invented as a way to get around uh, prohibitions on explicit racial segregation. And this is not a legacy that we wanna move forward into the future. Um, if you were to look at my fourplex from the front of the street, you wouldn't necessarily find it out of place in a uh, single family zoned um, neighborhood. And so I really encourage people to examine their, exam their assumptions and consider some more flexibility about the ways we can get um, more people housed throughout our community and not just all along El Camino. Um, I wanted to make a comment about with density, how the different trade-off factors include how much room you give for cars and how much room you allow for the units. Um, and I would really urge us to have codes that um, and priorities that don't, that the priority is room for people over room for cars. So it shouldn't be a bunch of um, squeezed uh, studios just so everyone can have by law, you know, two parking spaces. Um, parking requirements are an antiquated uh, thing that has led to a lot of affordability problems. And we want it to be building for a future um, that is less dependent on cars, uh, which is what we need to survive our climate emergency. So thank you so much for this great meeting and look forward to continue to be involved. Okay, uh, thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Ellen Jacobs Dooley, um, who will be followed by Brittany Baxter. Hi, well, thank you very much for having this workshop. Um, I'm enjoying all the participation and uh, I, do, I do notice or did notice that there wasn't a lot of conversation mentioned about uh, the aspect of climate change and how it's going to influence uh, the, particularly the area that is east of uh, Caltrain tracks, which is predicted to flood if we don't do anything about, um, you know, our, our uh, adapting at the, in the, on the, along the shoreline. Um, so that concerns me because I think it's a really, uh, it's a really de uh, desirable area to develop and yet at this point, it's not going to be a very feasible area to develop. So I just wanted to, you know, make a comment about that, that it's something that really should be taken seriously in looking at future planning. So that's really all I had to say. Thank you. Okay, thanks for your comment. Uh, Brittany Baxter, you're our next speaker. Awesome. Thanks so much for hosting this and for <clears throat> showing us all these great examples of housing. Um, so I just thought I would share my perspective since there may be folks here who don't know <laughs> some of our uh, younger residents here in town. Um, but I'm a 32-year-old homeowner here in San Carlos. I've been in the Bay Area for about 10 years um, and I've had friends all over the income spectrum from bartenders to people who, you know, never have to work again a day in their life. Um, and it's been great being able to share my 20s and the start of my 30s with a lot of those people, but as many people here have mentioned, we're losing a lot of our population. 
and when I look at who from my network has moved away, it's been a lot of people under, I would say about a household income of $500,000. Um, in the earlier meeting back in November, I think the presenters had talked about the fact that our average cost of a home here is $2 million. That works out to be $9,000 a month in housing costs. Um, I can personally vouch for that. <laughs> and banks won't lend to you for that if you make under $500,000. Um, so I am pretty concerned about that in terms of the future of our town. I think we all like to enjoy shops and services and first responders and nurses and um, elder care here and you know all the different needs that we have. Um, we all rely on a lot of people below that income level. So I, you know, I love to have the nurses and first responders for when I get sick. I want to be able to send my kids to a school instead of having to homeschool them myself. There's a lot of people I rely on. Um, at that part of the income spectrum. And I think if we don't plan for dense housing at all income levels, um, we're gonna be in a really tough spot going forward because we can't force people to work here. <laughs> we need to enable housing that lets them build a sustainable future here. Um, there's great condos that you can build in three and four bedroom configurations. I have seen them. Um, I think they're a really great solution for the next generation, um, all of us under 40, who wanna live here and contribute to town and be part of a diverse, inclusive community. Thanks so much. Okay, thanks for your comment, Brittany. Um, I don't see any more hands uh, for public comment. Um, and I do want to give um, Lisa Porras a, a chance to um, respond. I know there was a reference, uh, one of the comments was about climate change. And if you want to mention briefly the um, city's um, climate action planning efforts that are underway, um, and then also any, any responses or additional information you want to share. Sure. So talking about climate change, the city uh, adopted its first climate action plan in the year 2009 when the general plan, the current general plan was adopted um, as well. So right now there is an effort to update that plan and it's actually going to be a plan that includes some resiliency strategies and adaptation strategies. So it's not just tracking, but looking kind of more, you know, um, action oriented with developing some strategies to address climate change. So we do have um, um, a website for that. Um, and I don't have it off the top of my head, but I know if you Google climate mitigation and adaptation plan, San Carlos, you will find the link and can track that process as well. Um, but I will say that our team, uh, because we're also working on an update to the safety element, which does incorporate some climate related aspects such as um, risk to the city, physical risk to the city, including wildfire, etc. We are working closely with their team to make sure that both all of the policies are internally consistent for the city. So I would encourage folks who are particularly interested in climate change to um, hop on that process. I know it hasn't gone um, to any hearing yet and I think there may be additional workshop, but you, you should, I, I would recommend looking that up. And, and um, Adam Lokar with the city of San Carlos is the person that you would wanna to speak to in terms of the timing and what are the next steps. Um, and I think there was also a comment about um, the the ability to have a voice at city council and how development works with um, with when when zoning is in place, um, and I I just wanted to put a little bit of clarifying information out there. There is a state law called the Housing Accountability Act um, that does require. Um, so it's not just a San Carlos thing. It does require cities if the zoning is in place and a project comes in and that complies with all of those places those rules, um, the city is not allowed to um, disapprove the project. They cannot um, say that project is not approved and they can't reduce the density of it. So that's a state law called the Housing Accountability Act. So just wanted to put that out there. Okay, great. Thanks for the follow-up um, to that public comment. So with that, um, there aren't any more raised hands. So we were going to close the public comment and we just have about three or four minutes left. Um, so I want to turn it back to Lisa Porras to walk us through our next steps. What's going to happen next? Okay, thank you, Joan. Sure. Um, so Essentially, what we want to do is remind you to take the survey. I know we mentioned that a couple of times, but we really want to make sure that um, anyone who hasn't taken the survey or friends or neighbors, colleagues, um, 
family, friends, all take the survey. As you can see from tonight's workshop, these are pretty important topics and concepts and ideas and solutions that we're sort of having our first conversation about. So we wanna make sure to capture all comments as much as we can from the community. And then following this workshop, we're going to be um, targeting our third workshop so we can have additional discussion about the RENA numbers, um, that 2700 number that is a draft number at this point, but we need to have further discussion on it and start to look at um, how this is going to land. So tonight we received an incredible amount of information. And again, thank you all very much. We have a lot to work from in terms of hearing from you and then kind of sifting that through and seeing, well, what is this going to look like in terms of potential location? So we want to come back and have a continued dialogue with you on that. Um, similar to this workshop, we're going to be sending out um, email lists to notify you when that workshop is going to take place. So if you haven't signed up already to receive email notifications, um, please do so so that you can be informed and receive that email um, notifying you when the next workshop is going to be. So I think we're planning that probably within, um, let's see, we're at the um, um, almost at the end of January, most likely maybe late February, early March, just to kind of give you an idea that it won't be too long, but also not too soon. And Meg, let me know if I got that um, kind of general time frame um, identified correctly, just to give folks a sense of when when they might expect to see us next. Thanks. Yeah, um, I wouldn't. I don't think we'll be ready for for another workshop to really um, talk until at least March. Okay. So a little bit later than late February, March. We'll, we'll look ahead at March, but so yes, so please sign up and um, give us your email. For those of you who already have, great. We're gonna be communicating with you that way as well. And um, I think that's it. Are we at the last slide, Joan? Yes, we are. So I think we ended, oh, just almost right on time, one minute over. This was a lot of work that you guys, um, participated in. And I just want to say thank you very, very much. And until next time, and if you have any questions, please reach out to city staff. We are available. We'll be able to talk to anyone who has questions about this process as we move forward. Thank you again. Have a good night. Okay. And uh, on the next slide, we have Lisa's contact information. So, you know, again, um, keeping, if you have any comments or questions, going to the website, that will be the main source of information. The, um, uh, the Zoom from tonight is recorded. We'll have it closed captioned and that'll be posted on the website. That takes a couple of days to process. Um, and then behind the scenes, we will be looking at the mural. We're also going to share that with you, um, but we will also take all of the content from the chat and organize it so that we have a clear understanding of your ideas. We also want to pay attention to um, the locations, um, you've, I think you've probably surfaced some, some new places for us to look. Um, and we also want to be keeping in mind your issues and concerns so that as we move through this process, we are balancing everyone's interest. So I really want to thank everyone for the high level of participation. Um, we had consistent engagement throughout and very high quality comments as well. So with that, we want to thank you. And I want to also thank our presenters and the city staff and everyone who supported the behind the scenes working on this. And with that, we're officially adjourned. So thank you for the, your time this evening. Good night. Thank you, Joan. Good night, everybody.